All right. Good afternoon. Welcome to Beyond the Fundamentals. I'm very excited today to have Justin Johnson on the channel. He is from Grace Ambassadors. And what we're talking about today is uh, mid ex dispensationalism. Um, I have on the channel, we've been going through the book of Acts, Justin, and for the sake of the audience. And people tell me, you're starting to sound like a mid ex dispensationalist. And I've never actually really looked into it hardcore. And some people have sent me videos and they don't really, they didn't really resonate with me. I feel like they feel like they're, I feel like they're leaving things out. But when I watched your videos, I find myself going, oh, that makes sense. Oh, that's what was missing. Oh, that makes, I find myself doing that a lot. Like that, that really clears some things up. And a lot of people that I talk to tell me that uh, you are the person to, to talk to about this issue. <laughs> So my wow. goal is I want to understand it. I have uh I have a like I guess I have an Acts 2 dispensationalist background that would probably align with Larkin Schofield and Ruckman. And so I have a lot of thought inertia. And what I find after watching some of your material, I watched your six-part series on the on remnant issues, and I found it um very informative. And so what I found as I'm going back through reading things in Galatians and Acts 17, I'm like, oh, that's how you would see this. And I don't know that I'm completely on the right track, but I definitely want to understand what's going on here and uh, try to overcome some of my own thought inertia. And at the same time, I also want to tell people in the in my audience where they can find a good presentation of mid-acts dispensationalism if they want to look into that. And so I put a link to your ministry, Grace Ambassadors website in the description of this video. So people can go find out about that. Got a, got a lot of people in my audience uh, who are very excited to see you here. So okay. that's exciting to me. Now our agenda, and I'll, and I'll turn this over to you in just a second, but the agenda that I kind of want to get to, I have eight things listed. And I think me and Justin agree that we're not probably going to get to uh, all of them, or maybe even three of them. But the remnant issue is a huge deal. When I started watching that, that's that's item number one, because most of the time I hear about mid-ax dispensationalism, I hear it from the negative perspective of what is not the body of Christ. But I, I've only ever heard you talk about what those uh, Jews from Acts 1 through 7, what they are. No, I've only heard you explain what they are as opposed to what they're not. And that made a whole lot of sense to me. And so I was hoping you could go over that a little bit, uh, the language of being born again and how you use that differently than where what I'm used to using it. And so I'm interested in that. The concept of baptism, eternal security, number five, Jewish Hebrew epistles, um, six, the Great Commission, seven, contradictions resolved by the mid-ex perspective, and eight, common objection responses, common objections and responses. So with... Uh, if you want to take a couple seconds and talk about yourself, any introductory comments you have, and then uh, we'll get into the issue of the remnant. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate you um, having me on to talk about it. It's nice to have a conversation to identify what it really is. Uh, yes. I mean, existentialism often gets impugned with wrong things, especially in the past. In the 20th century, there have been different books written, Harry Ironside and others historically, uh, covenant believers who would really impugn dispensationalism as a whole, put us all in a bucket. Right. along with uh, some heretics and kick the whole bucket. And so it's really nice to <laughs> have a conversation about what it really is. You know? yes. And um, yes. just a little background from where I am. I don't know how many people watching you know about my ministry or not, but I I'm a pastor of a church that is Mid-Acts Pauline Dispensational, or Bible Believing Mid-Acts Pauline Dispensational. So it's not just a website. It's not just a YouTube channel, Facebook group, even though there's a lot of those more popping out um, who, yeah. who try to communicate Mid-Acts. Uh, we actually have a church. We established one. Uh, from the ground up on that doctrinal premise. So I, I was learning how to rightly divide while we started a church. And um, so our church for years has been doing that uh, over a decade. So you were learning this as you were starting the church? Well, th that was one of the impetuses starting a church was that there was no other church oh, teaching see. this. So I, see. I, uh, see. I said, well, we're going to have to start our own. It started as a Bible study and, and back when I was in college. And then as we just kept doing ministry, there's a difference between Bible study of trying to explore things and mm -hmm. then when you're actually trying to put things to work, evangelism, mm -hmm. growing people in Christ, those are church functions. And so we started doing that. And it is it's somewhat evolved just by growing in the doctrine into a church. But it's neat and unique in that it's a mid ex Pauline dispensational church. And yeah, so yeah. When people come there, they get saved by the gospel, uh, the grace of God communicated by Paul, and they also grow in the knowledge of it. 
So we have children's classes, we have seminars, things like that. And our children, they learn how to rightly divide very young. And it's a shock to people because as they grow up in uh, traditional churches, not knowing right division, sometimes they communicate to our children and say, how do you know that? Well, if you get the doctrine right at the beginning, it's easier to grasp it. Well, can I ask that question? Like what, what got you into the, cause I'm be honest, I've, you know, I've been around Christianity a long time. And I've not really come across somebody who uh, could lay this out for me very clearly. So where, how did you come across this? Yeah. Well, and that's why I wanted to talk about us being a church, because that, that's part of the function of that. Uh, different than just having a YouTube channel where you're dealing with the, with people on the internet whom you don't really know, and, and you're, right, you're serving right. generally what democratically what everyone wants to hear. In a church, you have to feed people what they need to hear. Yes. And, what, yeah. and so that's a little different approach. And it doesn't always bode well for the internet. Uh, people don't like that about right. our channel sometimes. They're like, why are you talking about that? I want to hear this thing about the rapture or something. But it's because I'm dealing with people in the church that need to grow. And You're the trying to give them a good group. diet. Right, yeah, right. Good yeah. balanced so, diet. Right. And that has helped me as well as a minister grow to be able to communicate it simply and fundamentally instead of dealing with some of the more trivial or some of the more exciting things perhaps people want to deal with mm-hmm. a little mm-hmm. more advanced. You would mentioned listening to the Remnant series lesson. And that's one of those lessons where I told folks locally, we have new folks uh, often come in and uh, I told the new folks, you know, this may be helpful to you, but this is really requiring some prior understanding to grasp. So I was trying to fill in some gaps for some of our older folks. So it wasn't really a beginning series. I'm glad it answers some questions for you. Um, but as we said yeah, in our yeah. email communication, there's there's some things that come before that that you have to understand yes. before you, you fully appreciate it. So yes, yeah, mm-hmm. that's where I'm coming from uh, as a minister in a church with other people there communicating this doctrine. We're trying to communicate it clearly to people. And yeah, there's lots of resources on the website and most of them are generated from our church ministry. So um, that's a little bit about me. Yeah. Okay. So I, I appreciate that. Um, so the remnant series, the, so um, from what I understand from the series, when Jesus starts his ministry, it is not like I've always said, you know, Jesus ministry is to the Jews. And it doesn't get handed over like the ministry to the Gentiles picks up on Paul. You can get that out of Romans 15 um, and many other places, uh, Romans 11, Galatians 2. So the ministry, but so what your position is, is that the, the Jews to whom Jesus and Peter are ministering initially during Jesus's ministry and after the death, burial and resurrection would be not the body of Christ, but a remnant of Israel. Right. Yeah. So if you want to just give a synopsis of the mid acts position perspective, that'll help frame a lot of the future questions you have in your yes. agenda. And so, that one thing was the clicker for me, really. I mean, wow. saying it's not the body was confusing mm-hmm. to me, but saying that it is the remnant of Israel, that kind of made some light bulbs go off in my head. Right. Right. So traditional dispensationalism set itself apart historically from covenant belief and reform belief by right. making a division between Israel and the church as, as uh, people who had different purposes from God, though all being the people of God, which covenant theologians have been talking about for centuries, they had different purposes and instructions and descriptions of who they were as a people. One was a nation, right. one was a body, things like that. So traditional dispensationalists have that grasp of Israel and the church. And mm-hmm. mid-axis dispensationalism uh, does follow that a bit in that there is Israel and the church distinction. But what mid acts dispensationalism uniquely says is that that church that we've been making mm-hmm. distinct from Israel mm-hmm. didn't begin until the middle of the book of Acts. And really what that means it has nothing to do with the book of Acts itself, which throws people off a little bit. They, they go right. into Acts trying to find it. It's really not there. Um, it has to do with Paul. So we, we believe first a dispensation was given to Paul. And by that, we emphasize uniquely to him or, or chiefly to him, exclusively to him. So that this, this dispensation, which describes the church today, mm-hmm. was given first to the Apostle Paul. Um, that dispensation, we say, was was describing something that was kept secret. And so it wasn't right. just an additional progressive revelation or something added on to previous understanding of what God was doing, uh, though all right. that's true. It was also including things that were not known or written about ever before. Romans 16, 25 says it was mm-hmm. kept secret since the world began. Mm-hmm. So the dispensation given to him exclusively about us today was kept secret. Um, thirdly, that revelation, you need to define what it is. So a lot of mm-hmm, folks mm-hmm. you may hear talk about mid-acts that they kind of go there. Well, it's prophecy, mystery, it's different. It's not this, not that. And like you said, it's different than defining what it is. 
And that's right. something we've done in our church ministry as well. We, we see that problem. People say, oh, there's a mystery. Oh, there's dispensations. But they have no clue what, what it is and what the importance is. Right. The, the revelation or the dispensation given to Paul can be summed up in, in two primary teachings. One is the revelation of salvation or the, um, the glory of the cross. Right. So yeah. the, the preaching of the glory of the cross, not the mm -hmm. cross itself, but the glory of it is unique to the Apostle Paul. And we think that okay. that follows when you read the scripture. You don't find the cross preached that way anywhere else except from Paul's epistles. And Paul even says in Galatians six that God forbid that we should glory saving the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And of course, as Christians who are saved, we better glory in the cross. That's the gospel that saves us. Christ died for our sins. He was buried and rose from the dead. That is the gospel that saves Christians. Right. Today. Yeah. First we Corinthians preach that 15. as good news. We preach yeah. that is, this is a great thing that he died for our sins and rose from the dead. Yeah. That communication of it, that perspective on it, uh, was something that had to be revealed to the Apostle Paul because before him, the cross happened. And this is, gets into the early Acts period that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, it occurred. The disciples knew it did. They witnessed it, um, even though they didn't know why. Then he rose from the dead. He explained that it had to happen because prophecy predicted it would happen. And they got that. And then when they preached it in early Acts, they didn't preach it as a glorious yeah, means. It was, a it was an indictment. Yeah, it, they were condemning the nation for doing it. So they called yeah. him to repent for killing him, which, of course, is the right thing to do. I mean, you shouldn't kill your Messiah. But the, the preaching of the cross as a glory, we find uniquely uh, starting with Paul. So that's the first aspect of that special dispensation given to him, the dispensation of grace. The second thing is this body of Christ, which Paul calls a new creature. Mm -hmm. And this, this entity, this organization, a spiritual man that was created uh, by the Lord Jesus Christ, he's the head of it, that mm -hmm. all believers are a part of today, no matter mm -hmm. male, female, Jew, Gentile, they're all part of this body of Christ, the church, the body of Christ. Uh, that description is not found anywhere outside of Paul's epistles. So mm -hmm. you can find God's people outside of God's epistles or Paul's epistles, rather, you can find, you know, his congregation, those that believe in God, those that are trusting Jesus. But the description of this entity called the new creature, the body of Christ, that's Pauline language, mm -hmm. that is only found in Paul. You don't find that anywhere else in, in scripture. Right. And right. so th those two things constitute this mystery revelation, this dispensation given to Paul. Yeah. So a lot of people and, will conflate yeah. the idea of being born again and a new creature. And I know that's right. another that's that's point number right, right. two. Yeah, one but of your points. That's, yeah, that's yeah. what I've always done, and I didn't know mm -hmm. any better. I, I never heard any different than that until re relatively recently. Yeah, yeah, and, and it would seem harmless. We'll get to that as we talk to born not born again and things, but it seems harmless to call yourself this or that until you see where the Bible calls the people that. And uh, mm -hmm. when you don't find Paul using the language, and you find the language only in the Old Testament or in Matthew, Luke, and John, it puts you in that context. And now there's something you better understand or you're going to get in trouble that yeah. that they didn't. The, the people in that context did not know maybe what you're imputing there. But um, so, yeah, there's those two points to the, the mystery dispensation about the glory of the cross, and the new creature. There are other mysteries that were spoken about Paul. Those were the main ones, though. This, however, leads to what you were saying. Understanding there's a dispensation exclusive to Paul. It right. was not spoken of before since the world began. Right. And it concerns the, the glorious preaching of the cross and this new creature, the body of Christ means that the body of Christ in its identification and its doctrine and its ministry and even its gospel, I would say, is found in Paul's epistles alone, which raises the question, who are these people? You know, they're yes, not indeed. Paul, who's Peter yeah. the 12? Who are those yeah, disciples are these of Jesus? Right. And traditional dispensationalism, and, and this, this gets to what makes Mid-Acts somewhat unique, but it's more of a conclusion than it is the starting point. That's what I was saying before you have to understand some other things. Because the, okay. the whole remnant idea is a conclusion of understanding a dispensation given to Paul and what it is. But okay. traditional dispensationalists say Israel and the church are different. And you're probably familiar with a lot of those arguments. Right, and they're right. valid. Um, however, traditional dispensationalists usually will say that it's Old Testament Israel that returns in the future. So dispensationalists are futurists in the sense that Israel returns in the future and their kingdoms will be literal you know, all those things will be literal in, in the kingdom on earth. So they talk about the red heifers in Israel and things like that. Mm -hmm. Well, this is, this is all literal in the Bible. Um, and what they typically do is take everything in the New Testament and make that the church. So right, Old Testament right. is Israel. New Testament is church. So Jesus came to establish this church, as he told Peter, to, to build upon his church. Right. Yeah. And Acts, Acts uh, 1, there were people added to the church. So this the New Testament is the church. And they take that from Matthew to Revelation. Yeah, yeah. And 
they get a little bit of a hiccup in Revelation because there's the Israel thing that they need to bring back, but then there's the church right. thing. And so they, they're, they're trying to figure out what <laughs> church is in Revelation, which is an ongoing debate. What Minax does yep. is says, uh, well, what if the church began with Paul, as we, we seem to see that the body of Christ descriptions only found in Paul's epistles, and there mm-hmm. was a dispensation given to him that was not known before. Mm-hmm. And so maybe who we are is what, what Christ is saying through Paul, which leaves us out of Israel's covenants entirely. And so we're not in Israel's old covenant that was, is clearly understood by all Christians. Uh, we're not under the old covenant. But neither are we under Israel's new covenant, and that and that okay. is what makes us distinct. Uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of Christians big. say, "Oh, we're part of the New Testament. We're part of the right. New Covenant." And one thing I noticed in the series that I watched is that that covenant language is specifically for Israel. It's right. not for us. Right, and and the reason why I say this is a conclusion is, and I think an important one that makes it clear the mid acts position is because there are people who who okay. understand a dispensation was given to Paul. There were people who understand a mystery was given to him that was not spoken before. And they don't quite go to the point of declaring clearly that we're not under every covenant given to Israel. And I think that causes confusion. And these, these are people who would claim to be mid-Acts or claim to rightly right. divide. Historically, Brother Stam and others, uh, he's long right. dead now, ha- have communicated that position. So right. they communicate a mystery just trying to make known to people that, hey, Paul had this dispensation. And that's good because that's the premise on yep, what you think yep. But I think the logical conclusion and necessary for clarity is to say that the body of Christ is not under any covenants. All the covenants are prophetic. All of them are for Israel, even the new one. And that identifies right, right. for us then what Christ was doing in Matthew, Luke, and John. If he was not revealing the mystery, he was establishing this new covenant Israel, this new covenant group. And, and that would be even a stronger yeah. argument against like Calvinism. You know, Calvinists yeah. are always misappropriating like Ezekiel 36. Mm-hmm. And I'm, you know, I'm always pointing out that is not to you at all. That's not to us. That's right. strictly for Israel. And right. we, when you understand the covenants, the way you're talking about them here, that would even double down on that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. We have yeah. no play. That's part of the Jewish covenant it has nothing to do with us. Right. And I think that that is, that is as you said before in your email, uh, so much it's a powerful ex- explanation power with Minex position because yeah, it does. Yeah. Uh, the, the contradictions and disputes um, that are in Christianity. And of course there's always going to be that, but the major ones, right, as you talk right. about Calvinism, Arminius, things like that, a lot of them are, are based upon the fact that you can find verses in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John of the Hebrew epistles that seemingly contradict what Paul says. Mm-hmm. And, and yet everybody thinks the entire new Testament's for the church. And thus you have the same, uh, parent contradictions or disputes that the New Testament would seem to produce in the right. church. Right. But when you make the division right mm-hmm. and say, well, no, no, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John technically is actually Old Testament before Christ died, according right, to Hebrews right. 9. But it's dealing with the new covenant Israel. There's nothing mystery there. There's nothing about the body of Christ. Then you can see that link between the Old Testament and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, mm-hmm. and it still not be us. You can mm-hmm. see the link in Hebrews and in Revelation to Israel in the Old mm-hmm. Testament, but it's not Old Testament Israel, it's New Testament Israel, mm-hmm. and yet it's not us. And so that separates that. And so if the description of who we are is found exclusively in Paul's epistles, a lot of those contradictions go away. And as you said, it's a stronger defense against those who would would use passages you know, that are opposite of Paul's, Paul's truth, whether it be eternal security or, right, right. or, or salvation or, or what have you. Yeah. So, I mean, you said a second ago, like right to right now, today, um, everyone's saved the same way, Jew, Gentile, male, female, uh, no distinction. And, but the remnant, at least during the Bible time frame, during the time frame of the Bible was the remnant. They were Israel. They were distinct from the body of Christ. Mm-hmm. So, um, when did that, if you're a believing Jew, at what point did you stop being part of the remnant and start being part of the body? Was there yeah. like a transition point where that started happening? So, I mean, right. I guess like if I'm reading through, I'm in Acts 17 right now, and I see that Paul is going to the Jews first. And um, is he is he ministering to them as part of the remnant, or do they believe and become part of the body? Like, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what to do with that. You know, if, I, right. if I'm trying to apply this perspective, I'm not sure where to go with some of that stuff. Yeah. Well, those, those are common questions, questions we've been facing for, for decades and years. And um, these are the same questions people get when they grasp the first point I just made about a dispensation given to Paul and they see 
Okay, yeah. I see where you're coming from. Those are natural questions. I always yeah. point out though, before I answer these, and by the way, just to interject here, every Sunday morning as part of our, our church assembly, because we think it's an important function, we, we have two meeting times, like many churches. Um, and, and the first one is always Q&A. It's like an hour, hour and a half of Q&A. People come to the church, they ask whatever question they want. And, and we that respond. That sounds to awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is pretty cool. So yeah. you, you said we have an hour and a half here. This is much like a 10 a.m. at our church every Sunday morning. And so yeah. I've heard this question quite a few times because it's a question people have. Yeah, um, yeah. Th so, yeah, that's what we do there. And that's how I knew we wouldn't deal with your whole agenda because I know how quickly it takes to answer something. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah. But we do it every Sunday. Um, so, yeah, it's a very common question. I always point out, though, before I answer it, that this question and questions like this, some of them are disputed among mid-axis dispensationalists or among those who recognize okay, yeah. that this okay. is given to Paul. And that's to say that it's not fundamental to the mid-axis position. Okay. The mid-axis position, like I said, is appreciating a dispensation was given exclusively to Paul, that mm -hmm. it was not spoken since the world began, and it concerns the glory preaching of the cross and the body of Christ, a new creature, mm -hmm. which creates, by virtue of that, a, a, a New Testament Israel, ident you know, people yeah. identified as that. But th yes. that's the fundamental. There are obviously questions, as every position would would create, and so the question of whether the remnant became part of the body or not part of the body, um, Brother Stan, for example, and others have said, well, they became part of the body. That was okay. 50, 60, 70 years ago. Right, Again, right. They, he Same also thought we're part of the New Testament and part of the New Covenant, so I think that's problematic as well. Okay. If you take the consistent position, I think, to say that we're not under any covenant, then those, those people who are part of the remnant, they were given a... a a covenant position, a position in the new covenant. Okay. And what God has given to people, he doesn't take away from them. He promised, just as a, a case in point, the disciples, he promised in Matthew 19, 28, to sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel in the regeneration mm -hmm. when he returns to the earth. Mm -hmm. I don't think Christ says, you know what? I'm going to take that back and put you in this body in heavenly places. Right? It, it, I, that, doesn't, that doesn't seem to, to work that way. So what? who Christ gives positions to, I believe that he... He keeps those promises, which means the okay. remnant who were believing what God yeah. wanted them to believe and doing what God wanted them to do before the revelation of the mystery, they that that's what they their hope is in that. They would no doubt learn things from Paul as more revelation was given, right. but they would also recognize that who Paul is describing is not who they are. Is not so who they ecclesiastically, were. they're still separate entity. Sure, sure, yeah. And, okay. and this speaks to to the the idea that you know in john 3 john the baptist had followers and disciples and in the whole gospel history there were people operating in israel under the old testament i mean it was right, old right. testament history until christ dies and hebrews 9 says that death of a testator uh, is yeah. where you get the beginning of a testament you know yes so yes. even though our book bibles say new testament matthew 1 it, yeah. it it's really and living under old yeah testament. we've covered that a lot on this channel so the right. audience here should good. be familiar with that good yep. yeah so the, there were people that are living under the Old Testament, and then they hear John the Baptist, you know, and they and they believe what he's saying. And so they, yeah. they follow his instruction, get water baptized and things. Um, the question might be asked, well, what do you do about these other believers in Israel that are Old Testament believers? And, and they're not water baptized by John yet. Well, the answer for John would be to minister to them. Or what about when Jesus came? Because John wasn't necessarily preaching uh, the same things Jesus was in the sense that Jesus said, I am the son of God, I'm now here. John the Baptist was saying he was coming, right? He's, yeah, he's, right, right. he's going to come. So Jesus said, I am him. Um, and so that's a little different. So you even have an account of this in the Bible where there's people who follow John the Baptist and didn't yet know who Christ was. Yeah. Right? Well, Acts 19. Yeah. We had not heard yeah. whether there be any Holy Ghost, right. you know, so what do you do heard with these of John's people? baptism. Right. What do you do with these people? Well, throughout the scripture, people respond, men of faith respond to God based on what he's told them. And there's always times where God's revealing revelation and not everyone has heard the thing. Right, and right. you, you got to ask yourself, well, what happens to them? And I don't think I don't see any evidence in Scripture where God just usurps them out of their context and puts <laughs> them in something. Else. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. So, so I think it's the same thing in that principle with the body of Christ, where he sent Paul not to Jerusalem. He didn't send him to John the Baptist's disciples or Peter's right, group right. and say, go tell them that they need to get up to speed. He didn't say that. He sent them to Gentiles. He said, go out to Gentiles, which was dispensationally out of out of time. That was not okay. yet supposed to happen. Um, but he sent them there anyway. So geographically, the ministries were separate. And that's evidenced by the fact that Paul didn't even go to Jerusalem until 15 years later in, in Acts 15. Can, can you double click on that statement you made uh, dispensationally that was out of time, that was not yet supposed to happen? Sure, yeah. 
yeah, yeah. D according to the prophets, uh, it, Gentiles would always be blessed uh, through the nation of Israel. Right. Going back to um, Genesis 12 and 15, where God promised to Abraham that he would be a nation and all the families of the mm -hmm. earth would be blessed through him. Mm -hmm. And that promise was repeated through Isaac and Jacob and then to the nation of Israel. Israel was set up and God set them up to be his, his channel of blessing, so to speak, to right. the world. God always wanted to bless the world, which included sinners of the Gentiles, but it would be through his holy people, through mm -hmm. his Messiah, who would come to his holy people, right? So it would be through that one nation that he'd set up as a holy people, and they would be the, the priests to the world. Isaiah 61 talks about that, how Israel will be, the whole nation will be priests. Yeah. yeah. And they're priests to I've, the Gentiles. Yeah, I've, I've cast that before as uh, the Gentiles were always intended to come, but they would they would come in what we now call the millennial kingdom which right. would have happened earlier if the remnant ministry would have been successful. Right. Something right. Like so that. what I meant by out of time was that Israel would bless them through their salvation and rise. So it was through Israel's being blessed first, which meant they believed okay. and God blessed them that way, which meant they'd have needed to have a good covenant standing. Right. The old right. Testament couldn't do that. Of course, the new covenant right. is how they do that. And so when they're in that good new covenant standing, when the new covenant is fulfilled completely mm -hmm. and Israel is the blessing of God, then the nations get blessed through them. Yes. So when Paul was sent to the Gentiles with a blessing, Israel had, they didn't receive the gospel. They had killed apostles. They had rejected apostles. They had right, stoned right. Stephen. And it, they'd kicked the believers out of town. Actually, after 8 verse 1, they were scattered <laughs> at the persecution by Saul. So this was yeah. not, as the prophet said, what happened in Israel's kingdom. Mm -hmm. Now, the prophecies talk about Israel, Israel's rejection of, of the gospel in Christ, but not not that that's how Gentiles will be blessed. Mm -hmm. And so when at that moment, before he brings the kingdom to Zion, he tells this apostle who's also a sinner uh, and saves yeah, him yeah. by grace, says, hey, you, you go to these Gentiles and tell them what I've done with you and what I'm telling you to do. That's out of time. And Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 5. He was saved as one out of due time. Born out of due time, yeah. Yeah, born out of due time, yeah. So him going to Gentiles with salvation during Israel's fall it, it is a mystery, a part of the mystery. Um, how, how can Gentiles be blessed while Christ is rejected in Israel? Prophets said he would need to be received by Israel for Gentiles to be blessed. Right, right. It, it, that's not what's happening now. It, and, and I think that is fundamental to the whole dispensational idea, Israel and the church right, separation. Right. Whether, whether the mid-acts or not, I yeah. think that's in common, yeah. it seems. Right. Does, does that, think, that help with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I derailed you. I don't know if you remember yeah. where you were before I... <laughs> I forget. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we were talking about, uh, the different, like people following John the Baptist and like, when does one oh. stop being part of the room? Oh, they're in the we'll body stop. or not. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They're in the, when yeah. they start being yeah, part I don't of the body. See reason to, to put them in the body. Um, the, the way I've communicated it has always been that it's it, it, God identifies you by who, the message you believed, you know, when, when you, when you trust the Lord. And that's a very general statement because everyone in the scripture who's a man of faith or one of faith trusts the Lord right, about right. something. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're trusting the Lord about that thing you hear. <clears throat> and the remnant group would have heard a message like this, that that th this Jesus is the Messiah who had come. And uh, he, he's coming to bring this kingdom. And uh, when you repent and, and trust that he's the Messiah and, and his name, receive the forgiveness of sins, you'll receive the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you're baptized into this this better covenant you know that god promised yeah. from the prophets mm -hmm. to israel and and you'll get the kingdom you know the kingdom that's the message they hear mm -hmm. and so if you're that person and you hear that and you're a jew in the first century and, and you believe it you're saying yeah jesus is the messiah I, I saw the works i can't believe we killed him but the prophet said that needed to happen anyway yeah and you trust what peter said uh then you're expecting to enter this kingdom based upon your position this new covenant right yeah. and so yeah. i know we have to deal with that in our minds after the fact, like, well, what happened in that transition? But I don't see it, it had been that much of an issue for them as far as thinking, oh, am I now in the body or not? Because they were already believing Jesus is the Messiah. They mm -hmm. already believe he's the king. They already believe he's the way to get into the kingdom. And here comes Paul. He's preaching a similar thing. He's the savior. He's the head of the body and things like that. And, and when Paul preaches this mystery that this not Jew or Gentile, he does so on the basis of that we're all sinners, which, yeah. of course, those in the new covenant would have also understood because they needed forgiveness through Christ. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't necessarily have been contradictory to what they thought. Um, it, it would have been odd that he was going to Gentiles and they would need evidence of that. 
that was the whole right. Acts 15 council. Like, why are you going to yeah, Gentiles? The Cornelius up through Acts 15, yeah. Yep, in Galatians 2. But uh, even when that happened and Peter gave Paul the right hands of fellowship, there were some of the remnant that helped Paul around. And he they mm -hmm. went around helping him preach Christ to Gentiles because that's what Christ told him to do. So I, I don't see where anywhere in Scripture it says, oh, well, th those people rejected God's calling on them before for this right, new right. call. You know, when God calls you, meaning he's appealing to you with the gospel to be saved that's what you believe then that's what you're called so and um, th yeah. this gets to the born again issue and other things if he calls you through the new covenant and through jesus the messiah then that that's who you are that's okay. he defines who you are and so it's not for us to, to put someone else somewhere else and i don't see um what the scripture yeah. does that either. so so if paul's traveling around we're in Acts 17 for example he mm -hmm. goes into the synagogue of the jews is he, what's he doing there? Is he, is he bringing them into the body or are, yeah. are the Jews becoming part right. of the new covenant? What's happening with those right. Jews that believe in Thessalonica and Berea? Yep. Good question. Yeah. And this is why there's a lot of questions in the book of Acts uh, or yeah. about this position. The typical narrative in the book of Acts is the church began in the beginning with the Holy Ghost and it just grows yeah. and grows yeah. and expands to the world. That's generally the, the teaching. When you start reading the details in Acts, you see that in, instead of expanding successfully, everywhere the apostles go, they get rejected, uh, even Paul. And so at first it's yeah. Peter getting rejected. There's, there's a mix. Rejected. Yeah, it's a mix. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's believers, obviously, but the emphasis is on him going to these places and getting kicked out and being persecuted, which you don't right, read right. so much detail about in his epistles. He writes his epistles to the believers. But right. um you read Acts and you read all the negative that happened, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, which I think proves the point that the book of Acts is more about the fall of Israel than it is about the success mm -hmm. of a coming kingdom. Mm -hmm. And um, and that, that's why he goes there. So Paul goes to these synagogues in, in most of his ministry, the book of Acts, and that is because Christ sent him to Jews and Gentiles. Mm -hmm. I mentioned before he goes to Gentiles, and that's true. But in Acts 9, he uh, sent him to, to everybody, to Jews and Gentiles. He just didn't send him to Jerusalem, which I think speaks to um, Yeah, he where, told him not to go. Pretty right, clearly. Where, where, where Peter was establishing the kingdom, because remember, Israel's covenant and kingdom had to be established <clears throat> in Jerusalem first. It had to be there. Mm -hmm. That's where Zion was at. So the mm -hmm. fact that Paul's actually going preaching Jesus outside of Jerusalem, outside of Israel, is a testimony itself that God is not working through Israel. But that also in reverse shows that's why Peter was in Jerusalem. Acts 1 through 8 and beyond. Remember, the apostles stayed in Jerusalem even when the disciples fled. So, yeah, you're getting to Acts 17. What was he doing in Acts 17? Well, he's going to synagogues, and he's preaching what Christ told him to preach. He's preaching Jesus mm -hmm. as the Messiah, which mm -hmm. you would do to Jews because they've right. got scripture. If, if someone has a Bible, why not use it? And so he yeah, opens yeah. the scripture and says, look, this 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 man that I'm preaching yeah, he to you is with the them Messiah. out of the scriptures. Yeah, right. And, and, and if they get that past that, then he's saying that this guy died for our sins and he's preaching the gospel about forgiveness of sins by grace through Christ without the law and without the covenants. But he often doesn't even get there because when he's preaching, Jesus as the Christ or forgiveness through him. He gets kicked out, especially when he starts talking about Gentiles. And many times yeah. he does that. He says he's preaching now forgiveness to all men. He'll say he, you know, he sent me to Gentiles to do this, and they don't like that. Um, Acts, <laughs> yeah, in, in Acts thirteen is a good example of that. Acts thirteen, he goes to a synagogue, he preaches to them Jesus, and the way you read it, it's like there, there's some that, oh, okay, this is interesting. We'll hear you again next week. Yeah, yeah. Well, then he turns to the Gentiles outside the synagogue and says, "This is for you too," and right. that was his downfall because when he did that, those they, Jews around the fence they became they disaffected. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. And so he's definitely doing what Christ told him to do. He goes to synagogues first because if he told, if you were Paul, and of course Christ could have told him to do that, but apart from that, if you were Paul and you were sent to Jews and Gentiles, unbelieving Jews and Gentiles, mm -hmm. knowing that God had worked through Israel for millennia, right? And right. I already told them just we've left through them. Why would you put an unnecessary stumbling block in front of them by immediately going to Gentiles first and then to the synagogue? I mean, you want to go to that synagogue and get them on your side, at least give them the opportunity. And I, and I think also that's that's um, Christ's instruction as well, to give is, unbelieving Israel the opportunity to say, look, you can still fulfill this blessing to Gentiles if you believe this gospel, but they reject it. So it, it would still, in a sense, be a privilege to, to, to Jews believing and then ministering to Gentiles salvation through Christ, even though it wasn't the kingdom, it'd be salvation. And they reject that too. And that's why Acts 28 Paul says salvation has gone to the Gentiles now because you've refused it. 
So, yeah, Acts 13, 46, Acts 18, 6, and Acts 28, 28 uh, basically says you Jews refuse this, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. So you're, so if I'm understanding you correctly, he's presenting the kingdom to the Jews when he goes to these synagogues and then presenting salvation to the Gentiles? No, no, uh, no, he's preaching Jesus and he's preaching Jesus as he was sent to preach him. Um, pre- preaching Jesus as you and I would preach him in this dispensation right. of the church doesn't exclude what we know about Jesus according to prophecy. You know, it, okay. we, if we were talking to is a Jew today in 2022, we might start with Isaiah 53 and start with right, Psalm 22 right. and places. So we would definitely use that. Even though we know the gospel is that Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead, we need to get mm-hmm. them there. And that's, mm-hmm. I think, what Paul was doing too. So no, I, I'm not saying he was teaching two messages. He, he was preaching the same gospel. He just maybe began in a different place with, with Jews and Gentiles to get them there. Yeah, but, yeah. I, so if one of those Jews believed, would they be part of the remnant or part of the body? The body of Christ, yeah. Because like, like I said before, you, you are who, who God calls you. And the calling here is through the Apostle Paul. And he's calling them to be saved and saved by grace. Okay. Uh, saved by what Christ did for them. Saved by their Messiah, who's also the Christ who sent him to preach salvation by grace. Um, and so that's the gospel he's preaching. And there are some that believe that. And, and thus okay. they become okay. the Jews in the body of Christ. Okay. Where okay. technically there is no Jew or Gentile. So yeah, yeah, the people saved by Paul's gospel, his ministry, become part of this thing he's preaching, which is the body of Christ, because uh, that's how they're called. Okay, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. 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 The, the, yeah. Another reason why he's not preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and I have to mention this just for those maybe aware of some of the disputes among mid-ax people, because they're this is one of them. It's like, well, are they in the kingdom or not? Is he preaching the kingdom or not? Um, he can't be preaching the kingdom because he's outside of Jerusalem, <laughs> he's outside of Israel. Strictly speaking, the gospel of the kingdom is is, is about Israel's prophetic kingdom coming. Mm-hmm. That's what John the Baptist said. Right, right. That's what Jesus said. That's what Peter said. And they all preached that in Jerusalem because that's where prophetically the kingdom would come first. Yep, yep, absolutely. The kingdom, apart from the universal idea and the whole world being under God's dominion, the kingdom was promised to the nation Israel. It was promised mm-hmm. to that city specifically. And so when you have Paul leaving the nation geographically and leaving mm-hmm. the city, you know, you cannot preach the kingdom mm-hmm. because you, you'd be preaching a message like this. Well, the kingdom is going to come over there in that city, yeah, but they yeah. rejected him. <laughs> so I'm out here. Well, that doesn't even make any sense. It's like they've got to receive him in the city first for the kingdom to come. So right. his testimony outside of the nation was actually a testimony against the, the kingdom gospel being fulfilled okay. at that time. Okay. Yeah. So that's why he wasn't preaching that either. Yeah. People conflate the gospel of the kingdom with, G, with Paul preaching Jesus is the Christ. Those are not exactly the same. Right, Jesus right. being the Christ was part of the kingdom message. Obviously, you had to have a king before you have a kingdom. But him being the Christ is true for you and I today. It has nothing to do with Israel necessarily, except for the prophet said who Christ was. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. Um, I got a lot of people in the comments asking for certain things to be asked, but I just want to remind them that I'm not, I'm not here to do really. I want a clear explanation more so than I want to ask, have a, a, so I have a bunch of questions, but I'm not going to ask them all because I want to be able to get through as much of an explanation as we can, um, which I think will clarify some people's questions. Um, so I'm not like, like I told you before, I'm not here to put you on the spot. I'm not here to give you any gotcha questions or anything like that, but That's I do like want, I, said, I do with it every Sunday morning. So if you yeah. come out Sunday night <laughs> at the church, you can, you can get me. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I'm not trying to get you. I, I want to make sure that I understand uh, what this perspective is because I find it sure. I find it very intriguing. And when I look at, I think I consider a Christian, right? Mm-hmm. I usually have a Bible that I can wave around, but it's up there on the shelf now. Um, if you consider a Christian, I'm looking to what the future version of Kevin should be, and you're looking to the future version of what Justin should be, a, a more Christ-like version. If the narrative of scripture that I'm following is misunderstood, right. then I might have a bad vision of what future Kevin should look like, of what of what Christ-like Kevin for my calling should look like. So I think it's very important to get the narrative of what's happening in the Bible correct, to correctly right. understand that so that I can properly use it to formulate the vision of what more Christ-like Kevin should look like. So I have a good thing to aim for. That isn't, uh, you know, polluted by by misunderstandings. So that's why yeah, I think this issue it. is important. I want to understand it. That's it. That's it. And that's why I've been trying to tell people at the church as well, in my church, that um, 
the dispensationalism, even though it's been kind of corrupted this way, is really not uh, centered around eschatology. Uh, it's not about the end events, though, again, that, that is something obviously that is necessitated when you say Israel and the church are different right. uh, and future prophecy and all that. But the, the real issue is who are we uh, as the church? And you said individually, who am I? Like personally, right. who do I need to be? But that's crucially important. I mean, that's more than just what will happen down the road or signs we see right, or whatever. Right. That, that is, how do I live every day? And, and that's not as exciting as looking for signs in the headlines, but it, that is more important. Oh, it's very important to establish meaning in your life. Like, what do I do with this book called the Bible? What do I do with this book to help to help me be more like Christ? And if and if you misunderstand that narrative, um, you might be out there building an ark or trying to sacrifice your son on Mount Sinai or something. You know. Well, yeah. Well, worse than that, it it <laughs> impugns uh, the character of the Word of God too, because uh, even though you, you, people sincerely want to understand, they're not trying to do that. Many Bible believing people who want to defend God's Word, but by getting the narrative wrong, like you're saying. Mm -hmm. then you're saying the word of God isn't true in that place. So you can't take it literally. God didn't mean what he said, or that's not actually happening. And so it, it brings doubt upon what God says in the scripture. And, you know, as Christians like to say, they want everyone to be on the same page. And so the, the debates cause confusion and they're a bad PR for the church. Um, we need to talk about the issues, but yeah, a yeah. lot of the debates don't need to happen if everyone's misinterpreting the scripture, you know, so right, right. If, if there's a common narrative that this is the solution to it. It's not ignoring the problems. It's, getting on the same page with the issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, I like uh, what you, you said too, about your identity. You said you, you came from a Schofieldian type of acts to dispensational generic. Well, yeah, I don't agree with Schofield on anything, but basically sure. kind of Larkman, Schofield, Ruckman, yeah. basic concept traditional, of dispensationalism. Yeah, exactly, acts yeah. To. Yes. Yeah. But, Schofield said in his Bible um, notes, and again, he's not God or anything. He's been wrong before. Um, but he, he wrote in Act, Ephesians three, verse six in his notes. Yeah. He, he made the statement that in Paul's writings alone, we find the doctrine of position, walk, and destiny of the church in uh -huh. Paul's business alone. And he wasn't mid acts, but, but traditional sensationalists used to understand the first principle that, that mid acts sensationalists hold to, which is that this was exclusively given to Paul. They used to understand yeah. them. They didn't take it to the conclusion. So, so modern dispensationalists, uh, as tradition has passed down, has forgotten that. You can yeah. read a Schofield and, and guys in the, in the 19th century, and they would say things they would make dispensationalists today blush. Um, <laughs> because they, they would say things like the Lord's Prayer in Matthew is not for the church today. And, and they would say it outright because they separated Israel. I the would church. say that, yeah. yeah. Well, well, good. So, I mean, that, that's more traditional understanding of it. But that, that's on upon which mid acts is built. It's like, okay, it well, might be why people this. call me a mid acts person. I'm like, are you moving mid acts? Like, I don't know. So, when I, I, I did a video not long ago called, and by that I mean like two years ago, I don't know, called Replacing Dispensationalism. And the idea behind that was that dispensationalism really isn't a set of beliefs, it's a level of awareness that we bring to scripture what's different and what has changed and what are major historic phase line events before and after which you are reading about in the text that you're reading. Um, it's more of an interpretation methodology to understand where you are more so than a set of beliefs that you bring to the text, if that makes sense. And so yeah. the, the mid -axis There's beliefs that are affected me, by it, I think, but you're yeah. right. I like well, the way yeah. you, you frame that historically that, because I, I agree with that. It's not that out of nowhere, dispensationalism cropped up as some weird aberrant belief. No, no. Like, like so, Joseph Mormon had the golden plates or something. Um, it, it's based like the mid -axis upon- The position history. seems to bring up more, uh, it seems to be noticing some more things than what I'm used to being noticed, I guess. Yep. Yeah. And, and I agree with that. And so I, I like to put it in history as well, because we're not, even though, as you mentioned before, there's polemics, there's rhetoric against different churches, denominations, right, and right. that's to get people to open their eyes a bit. Historically, you know, who was it? Schaefer from the Systematic Theology of Dallas Theological Seminary? He was a Presbyterian. I mean, Scope, <laughs> yeah. these guys were covenant believers. And so historically, yeah. covenant believers saw things, and they were preaching dispensations before Darby, before dispensationalism right, right. became popular, it, it, as you might know already. So I have a book up here called Dispensationalism yeah. Before Darby that I wave around yeah. every now and then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's on my shelf too. But yeah, it, it, the idea of that, look, we need to look past just God shows grace on every page of the Bible. Covenant believers been saying this for centuries. Yeah, he does. Look closer at the context. Suddenly there's different contexts. Yeah. You know, call them what you will. And that, that's the dispensational idea. And then as you keep looking, you're like, wait a minute. You know, yeah, there's Israel in the church. And that church that is us, the body of Christ, wasn't known in Matthew either. And it wasn't known in Acts right. 2 either. Right, right. It's, that's all it is. It's looking more particular. 
and I think with the tools we have now and, the, and the, maybe the free time we have now, it, it's allowed us to be able to see things like that. People say, well, why yeah, didn't they definitely. see it 500 years ago? Well, they're running for their lives. That's one of them. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's like they, they didn't have uh, Bible apps on their phone and, you know, every commentary for the last 200 years on their computer. They exactly. Didn't have exactly. So. So let's, uh, if you don't mind, let's talk about yeah. this concept of being born again. Um, okay. I've always in. I've always used the term born again and used it interchangeably with new creature and with, uh, regeneration. And we have, a we have a friend of the channel who's been on a few times who, whenever we would use that term born again, he would, he would make a <laughs> face it would, like he was swallowing something sour. So there's yeah. something going on with that. And I kind of got a glimpse of it in your remnant series. You have one of them that's called born again nation. Yeah. So yeah. this phrase born again, um, talk about that for a few minutes, help us understand the, the correct usage of that phrase. Okay. Um, well, I, I'm going to be like a broken record here. And this is what I do at church all the time. I'm going back to basics because uh, this, the born again issue is again, something where uh, different people who have been traditionally mid acts, if you call it a tradition um, have said we were, and some yeah. say we don't, I don't think we are. I think it's inconsistent with the mid acts position. Uh, but okay. again, it's almost an internal dispute. It causes uh, friction with those who don't quite grasp what Minax is. Because like, wait right, a minute, right. born again. I mean, this is like fundamental Christianity. And it's really that part that I, I'd like to challenge more than like, well, let me explain what Minax says about born again, which I can do real quickly. But um, it, it's really about um, understanding that the Minax dispensational position tries to clarify who we are, as you pointed out, and what the gospel is. Remember those two points mm -hmm. of the mystery was the glory mm -hmm. of the cross and the body of Christ, which is essentially mm -hmm. asking, the gospel, how are you saved, and who, who are you? And those are two fundamental aspects of the mystery revelation. And so we talk about the gospel, which mm -hmm. is, I think, surrounding the born again thing. Um, born again is language that really has been popularized in, in the 20th century. Right. I mean, you, it you shows up in that. Gallup polls and things sure. like that, too. Yeah. So People use it to identify yeah true mm -hmm. christians or saved or whatever it is that they define that as so when people say well, i'm born again or they're born again I, I always have to ask them what do you mean by that like, yeah what do you that's think a great that question means? so so if you would say you're born again well what do you mean because i want to hear the gospel from you if you don't trust christ died for your sins and rose from the dead i don't care what you call yourself you're not saved you see right, and, right. and there are quite a few people and i've talked to them in, in evangelistic opportunities where they say they're born again and cannot tell you about Christ's cross, that they're trusting that. Because <laughs> Chuck Wilson wrote a book called Born Again back in the day when he was going through his scandal and all that. He, he talked about an experience. And this is what's become uh -huh. in evangelical circles is it's an experience that I had that changed my life. Right. Mm. So mm. my life was changed. I was born again. Mm -hmm. And uh, Charismatics use it in that way. It's like, have you had a born again experience? Yeah, you trust the Bible, but have you had a born again experience? Well, if it's that way, then, I mean, there's a, there's a ministerial, a ministerial problem with using that to describe yourself because you're not being clear about what the gospel is, what makes you a Christian. If your answer is I'm born again, that's not clear. I'm a Christian because I'm a sinner that needs a savior and Christ died for my sins and he rose from the dead. And I trust that as a sufficient, complete work for my salvation and eternal life. That that's yeah. what makes me a Christian. There's nothing else, mm -hmm. not what I do, not experience. I had a vision. I had a dream that I had nothing like that. It's that. That's the gospel of grace. And I think mid access sensational position clarifies that so well. Um, you, you, you have to preach that gospel to be mid mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. Another way to say it in reverse is that if you're not preaching that gospel, you're probably not rightly dividing. You're not mid access sensational because it mm -hmm. begins with what is the gospel? If the gospel is simply trusting Jesus, that's it. Just believing Jesus is the Christ or just believing him for whatever you want to believe him. You don't need Paul's epistles to do that. Mm -hmm. You don't need the preaching of the cross to do that. You don't need the cross itself to do that. You can believe in Jesus in Matthew chapter four or five or six and know nothing of the cross, which is precisely what those people were doing, believing Jesus without knowing the cross. That's right. In Luke 18, it says, and they understood, he, Jesus says, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and they're going to kill me. And three right. days later, I'm going to rise again. It says, and they understood none of these things. But back in Luke 9, it says they're going around preaching the gospel. Or it mm -hmm. definitely was not the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But yeah. it was still yeah. about Christ. Right. Right. Yeah. So Jesus was still there, but it's not the gospel that saves us today. So this is the, the, the first question we got to ask ourselves as Christians. It's like, what is the gospel clearly? Let's get back to that clear gospel. 
if the right. gospel is the cross of Christ, then that gospel wasn't preached before Christ died. And, and yet the born again language was. So you, you see the possible confusion. So that here. was revealed before Paul's ministry. And if Paul's ministry is wasn't revealed until it was revealed, <laughs> then yeah. uh, and he never talks about being born again. He does. Yeah, the closest people want to retranslate is in Titus 3, verse 5, with the washing regeneration. There. Regeneration, but, yeah. yeah. And he talks about born after the spirit and things like that. But yeah, he doesn't use the phrase born again, and he definitely doesn't make you Israel. And so again, it gets to the content of who does Paul say that yeah. you are? Okay. You know, well, you're this new creature of the body of Christ. You're nothing to do with Israel. Where in John, all over the book of John, he's talking to the audience of Israel. And and even in John 3, where he, he talks about being born again, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Right, right. right. First of all, you got to ask yourself, what did they understand to be that kingdom? You know, that kingdom of God, well, they would understand as all the prophets said and described it to be, which would be the kingdom to Israel. We we put back into that something that was foreign to John 3 when we say, oh, well, we think Jesus was talking with a wink, you know, about everybody in the universe. As Paul talks about, we're all saved into one body. He wasn't teaching that one body truth in John 3. In fact, in John 3, when he says, except a man be born again. He actually is, um, he's a little frustrated, it seems like, that Nicodemus doesn't already know this. Jesus is not revealing new stuff in John 3. He even says that. He says, how can I reveal to you, how can I speak to you about heavenly things if you don't understand earthly things? So, yeah, yeah, I just displayed the text on here, John 3. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot Mm -hmm. see the kingdom of God. Yep. Yeah, and go down to, um, is it verse 8 or 9 there? No, no, no. I need uh, verse 12. If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? He says in verse 10, art thou a master of Israel and knoweth not these things? You see that? So Jesus is not, this is new information Jesus is saying. He's not saying that. He's saying, Nicodemus, even if you don't believe me, like you got to understand this because this is what was already revealed. And in, uh, in our born again nation lesson that I that you listened to, that's what I was making the point of is that in the Old Testament, that the idea of being born again is taught back there. It's taught in the prophets about what Israel needed to happen to them and what needed to be before the kingdom came. In Isaiah 59, other places talks about the importance of the Holy Ghost or God's spirit being put on the nation before the kingdom came. I mean, Isaiah okay. at the end of Isaiah talked about that a lot at the last 10 or 12 chapters. We just covered that whole book verse by verse a couple of years ago and you can't get the kingdom to israel until god's spirit gives them the power to do so and it says you're a master in israel you don't understand this it seems to me he's not bringing up anything new he's simply saying you don't know what the prophet's been saying yeah he should time. be now there is a little bit of debate over that like where that should come from the calvinists mm-hmm. try to point to ezekiel 36 mm-hmm. and uh ruckman points to psalm twenty two thirty, which if i'm not mistaken i think you brought that up as well uh, a seed shall serve him it shall be accounted for a generation mm-hmm. um yeah so yeah. old testament passages should clearly be pointing to this um so you said isaiah 59 um yeah let's see if i can pull up the verse there i believe it's 59 I've got it pulled up over here and I can display it if I need to. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like, so if Paul's revealing something that's never before been revealed, it would not make sense that Jesus is talking about the same thing if he expects someone right. before the crucifixion and resurrection even took place to already be familiar with the concept. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the, what, the only way people could teach it, I know Baptists and others who use the phrase quite a bit, teach it this way. Um, again, they conflate the gospel with Paul anyway, so they have to, if they're Pauline at all. But, you know, Paul talks about our spirit being quickened and it being dead in sins, and our spirit's quickened when we believe the gospel, so our spirit becomes alive. It's regenerated, the washing of regeneration, right, right. renewing the Holy Ghost. So there's a spiritual, we, we need the spirit to be saved. That's clear. We need to be sealed with the spirit. Uh, we need our spirit quickened by Christ and by the gospel. And so people find this in Paul's epistles, which clearly explain what happens when you get saved. And they read that back into um, the prophets and particularly the gospels where Jesus talks about the need for the spirit and say, oh, well, he's talking about Pauline truth. Well, actually, uh, he's not, number one. But number two, when Paul talks about the spirit and, and how that works in us who are believed in our quickened spirit, he, he doesn't communicate that to um, as part of the gospel. It's a consequence of believing. 
Whereas Jesus is making it a precondition to enter the kingdom here. Yeah. Well, yeah. if they don't even know the cross of Christ, which according to Paul quickens our spirit, then how would they know to, how to be born again? And, and again, that, that just speaks to how prophecy speaks about the spirit, which is that he comes upon certain ones and doesn't based upon their obedience yeah. to what yeah. Christ told them. And so the question would be asked, well, how are those people in John three born again? How did they get the spirit? Cause mm -hmm. they didn't get it the same way we would. Right. Uh, right. Believing the gospel of God. And, and so, of course, you study that out, and they, they get the Holy Ghost of Pentecost there, and Jesus talks about the Spirit and how they're going to get it. But that Spirit is prophesied part of the new covenant. In Isaiah mm -hmm. 59, verse 21, Isaiah says, This is my covenant with them, saith the Lord, which Paul quotes in Romans 11, referring to Israel. And he says, This is my covenant with them, um, my Spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth forever. So here's the Messiah and his nation who have the spirit and, yeah. and they don't get that kingdom until they get that, they get the, the spirit. So Isaiah brings this spirit up over and over again, in his latter chapters dealing with the kingdom, Isaiah 57, 15, Isaiah 44, other places I had in my outline before that you'd mentioned. 57, 15. Yeah, he talks about the humble spirit and the spirit of the humble in Isaiah 50, uh, 57 and Isaiah 44, he talks about pouring out a spirit, I believe. I mean, you could do a search for spirit in the book of Isaiah and right, right. You find quite a few verses. It's interesting how the prophets speak about the Holy Spirit because mm -hmm, you, mm -hmm. you have the whole Godhead issue as well. Like, well, are the three and one back there? Of course they are. But you can only see it by knowing that the spirit is God. And then you start studying the Old Testament and you start seeing them everywhere. But the prophets spoke of the spirit and how he would be given to the nation. Isaiah 44 talks about his servant Jacob. And mm -hmm. verse three, he'll pour water upon them. And, um, and, and so the, it talks about their salvation in him giving what Ezekiel 36 says is this sprinkling of water and the spirit that causes them to keep commandments. But, so, yeah, that, so going back to the term born again, which is, I think there's a lot of baggage to it and a lot of um, sentimentality to it as well. I mean, in Christianity, yes. yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm a real Christian. A way to word that. Right. And it, you, have to, you have to kind of put that, you have to look through that and say, what do you mean by that? If someone doesn't know the gospel, that's really the main issue. It's like, you can call yourself whatever. If you don't know the gospel, then you're not saved. Um, if you are saved and you say, well, I like saying I'm born again. Well, then you need to understand that you're not in John three, you know, and that what's happening to you is according to Ephesians two and Romans chapter eight, it, you're not in Israel's covenant in John three. Oh yeah. I, I understand that. I understand salvation. And I understand that, you know, I'm defined by Paul's bills. I just like saying born again. Well, now you're just preferring a calling that God just didn't call you. And I think that just causes a little confusion. Um, yeah, yeah. So if we can avoid the confusion, I think it's yeah, better. I'm all about people. raising the resolution and articulation level to right. to as high resolution as possible. And if there's specific language that does uh, pertains to Israel and not to the body, that would be uh, something worth making a distinction over, I think. Yeah, yeah. that's all it is. So it, the born again question is more... Um, understanding what John three is talking about. There, there's still people who don't know what the book of John is even about. They think, well, I think I, I keep bringing up brother Stam. Um, he's long dead now, but he, he, he was a very prolific writer from mid exposition, mm -hmm. but um, he, he thought the gospel of John had some mystery truth in it. And it's like, well, that, I think it's incorrect, but he, he said that uh, as others, because as others have noticed the book of John uses the word believe a lot more than Matthew. Mark, right, and Luke. Right. And he's like, Oh, this belief idea that sounds kind of Pauline. Well, yeah, I accept that it's talking about the same people in the same historical context as Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And uh, Jesus isn't revealing any more mystery truth there than in those other three Gospels as well. So, Yeah, I think uh, Ruckman explains it as by time John sits down to write, he's, you know, we're in 85 mm -hmm. AD and he's got all the Pauline epistles on the table mm -hmm. in front of him right. before he starts writing. And then uh, he kind of, uh, he is i guess that shapes what i would call his salience landscape of what to report back that jesus talked about yeah well and this <laughs> that speaks, makes sense and this goes right and this goes back yeah that's the idea that that the, the apostles learn things from from their future revelations and are kind of writing it between the lines of their gospels uh which you would think makes some sense except that john has a lot of history and a lot of dialogue in it so it's like if he's putting words in their mouth they didn't say and that's just incorrect uh, so what parts of john are actually john speaking 
you know, his words. Well, yeah, I don't, partly... yeah, I don't know if it would be words he didn't say, but um, what he would select to say would be made more salient by what Paul also said. Yeah. Because, yeah, you, you know, that, that... you can't you can't say everything. Right. Yep. So he picked and chose some things. Of course, John himself tells us the purpose of his gospel, which was not to explain that, but it was to explain Jesus as the son of God in John 20, verse 31. So right, I mean, right. that's why he was picking those things to show that he was the son of God. But but it's also true that that John, as a writer in the New Testament, uh, first, second, third John and all this, uh, because he was uh, a younger apostle and because no doubt he, he had spoken with Paul and things like that, um, he does speak more about the, the unity of things. And that's because John particularly speaks a lot about Israel's unity in the future. I mean, think of Revelation. Mm -hmm. I mean, John's the author of Revelation. Jesus is the, is the revelator, but he, he wrote it down. Speaks about the reunited of Israel, the restoration of Israel. And First John speaks about that too. Uh, first, second, third John speak about the, the unity of, the, of Israel. And so does John. It's based on belief. It's, and I think it's John, the, the famous verse that talks about there's those of another fold and there's uh, two yeah, that come John together. 10. Yeah. yeah, And people use that and say, well, that's the mystery right there. Well, it, it, it sounds like two are coming together, but there's also prophetic teaching about that. In Ezekiel and Jeremiah, it speaks about the, the divided nation of Israel, two parts, Ephraim and, and uh, Judah coming together. Yeah. And that was the fulfillment of prophecy. And so you say, well, that, yeah, that's kind of a shadow of the mystery. People coming together. I mean, you got husband and wife in a marriage coming together. Paul yeah. talked about that as yeah. well. It doesn't teach the mystery until the mystery is revealed. And if you try to go <laughs> back there to learn about the mystery, you're not going to find anything that, that Paul doesn't say. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So you're going to find just it's 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 not mentioned at all. But yeah, this is the when you start getting into objections. This is what people do uh, to explain away the mid acts premise. That's why this whole born again conversation goes back to what's the mid acts position? A dispensation given exclusively to Paul, a mystery kept secret since the world began, so they didn't talk about it and teach it about the new creation of the body of Christ and the gospel. And, and the explanation to that. Because that is not, those positions is not what people hold if they're not mid-acts. Is they'll say, well, you know, people wrote about the mystery that they just didn't understand it. So you can actually, now that we, we, we can see it in Ephesians and in Romans, we can go back to the scriptures and see it everywhere. Yeah. Um, that's, the, that's the explanation. They'll say things like, uh, even though we didn't know about the church, the body of Christ, the details of it until it was revealed to Paul, the church began at Pentecost, even though nobody knew about it and nobody spoke about it. You know, they'll say things like that. The church began before it was talked about. So th that that's the way people explain it who are not mid-Acts. Yeah, that's but, what Ruckman always said, is that he would use Ephesians 2, where the uh, the one body goes back to the cross. Mm -hmm. Um and so therefore anybody who's in Christ after that would be put into that one body. So, right. Yeah. Yep. That's and how so it's typically the body begins at the cross, explained. which makes it an odd situation. Not only is it Ephesians two, it doesn't say at the cross, but it says by the cross um, there. So it's not at the time of it. It's, it's by the work of it, which is a different chronology, but also it means that there are people being put into the body and the, the apparent, according to that idea apostles laying a foundation of the church yeah right are are communicating truths that are not true for the church so here's peter communicating in acts one two and three laying a foundation if that's where you think the church is laid the apostles are laying it and they're preaching a separation between jew and gentile and they're doing that for nine or ten chapters mm -hmm. that's not a good foundation for the church <laughs> you, know, you know what i'm saying so if thinking is as ruckman says that it's like you can have something in your pocket and not tell anyone about it it's like, yeah, yeah, you can, but nobody knows what's in your pocket. You definitely can't use it if it's in your pocket. And so how can people function in the body of Christ if it's not out of your pocket? So I think the, the beginning of the body of Christ as, as a ministry, as a church identity, as a doctrine, knowing who we are, how we live, is all tied to the revelation of it. And that revelation is, is, is really not disputed much among Christians. It was given to Paul. Right, right. It's, it's definitely not revealed till Paul. Right. And so people, and there's, so there's disagreement that. over whether when it's in effect, right? Yeah. And, and I think that when you talk about effect, you're talking about real people believing and living a thing, and it can have no effect if they don't know the revelation. And so in Acts two, you have Peter preaching Israel and their kingdom. Well, how in the world is that the body of Christ operating? Only in the mind <laughs> of God, and only looking past what He's telling by unction of the Holy Spirit, Peter to preach. So it's like God's working against Himself, you know. It, seems to me that that's unnecessary. And, and I, again, I think that's just the historical evolution of the doctrine. You talked before about 
um, about that historical placement of it. I, that's just how dispensationalists have taught it. And as, as you look closely, say, well, I think we need to refine that a bit. This is where mid-axis dispensationalism comes from. And I, I think it makes things more clear. So tell me if I'm off base on this, because, you know, I have a lot of thought inertia. Um, if I go, if I take this concept, and I, if I'm, <laughs> this may be a little off, off the agenda, but this has been occurring to me for this whole time. If I go to Galatians 5, mm -hmm. and Paul says, I say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify to every man that is circumcised that he's a debtor to the whole law. Christ has become of no effect to you. Whosoever you are justified by the law, you're fallen from grace. Are these people, are these like Gentiles who are trying to go be part of the remnant? Or how would you, how would a mid X person understand that? Yeah. Yeah, well, part of the, the mystery, like I said, I keep going back to those basic things I mentioned to you. The mystery is the the gospel clearly revealed, which is the glory of the cross and his grace, right? Thus, the dispensation of grace, the gospel of grace, that's language Paul uses, uh, and also this body of Christ and who you are. And in all of his epistles, Paul's trying to, to lay that foundation that, that communication Christ gave him, which means he's dealing with the issues of the problems that result from trying to communicate that in a context that everything that God has said from the beginning of the world has been through Israel their laws and their covenants. And so you see the pushback always in that regard. I mean, Corinthians were a bunch of, of, of Gentiles who said, oh, we don't have to do yeah, the law yeah. anymore. That's great. And so they just went off on saying <laughs> sin's fine the deep end. Yeah. yeah. And Paul says, no, grace <laughs> does not teach us that sin is now acceptable. Grace teaches another way to operate. So you know, Corinthians is an important book because it talks about how, to, how, how do Christians live well or live godly without the law? Right, because yeah. he doesn't put them out of the law. He says all things are lawful twice, but he does give many reasons to Corinthians why good is still good. Right. And the Galatians is the opposite issue, where these are people responding to Paul saying, "Okay, we're we're saved by grace, but you know works still matter." And uh, we find works written about in Moses's law. Right, those are good works, yeah. and um, so they try to keep his law. And in fact, they're maybe persuaded by people that they can't get the full blessing unless they become proselyte, unless they get circumcised, because that's the blessing God promised to Israel. Right, right. Because there's blessing in this according to the scriptures. And so Paul's reacting against this. And he's saying, no, all the blessing you have today is in Christ. Like, that's a novel thing. Even when Christ was on earth, he was the Savior and the Lord and the Messiah. But he talked right. about going off into sacrifices in the temple as Moses taught. And he talked about a future coming kingdom. So it was future blessing. Well, here's Paul coming along. And he doesn't talk about the future kingdom blessing you're going to get. He doesn't talk about. Um, you know, you keeping Moses or offering sacrifices, he says, you get all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Everything yeah. that you get freely is by his grace. You get it by, by Jesus Christ because of his work, because of what he's done and who you are now yeah. in Christ. And so he explains why that is. And the Galatians, you know, they need to learn that. And so he actually questions in Galatians 4, he questions them. He's like, I'm afraid of you. I have to go back yeah. to first principles here, because if you think that you get blessed by your works, by your flesh, then you may have missed what I told you about getting blessed by Christ because of his work, his finished right, work. Right, right, right. See, that goes back to the gospel. So he, he never questions the Corinthians about their trust in Christ because that's their whole excuse for sinning, is that, well, well Christ you know, saved you. This whole perspective makes me bring, like, um, somewhere of Paul, I'm, I'm of a Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, that kind of thing. It makes me wonder if there was, a, like, how, I, how cognizant were the people of the two coexisting ecclesiastical bodies and was there any uh, like carnal rivalry between the two bodies and then some people trying to get uh, recruited to cross over into the other one <laughs> you know yeah. i'm wondering how much of that was going on now right. that i start looking at this through this new perspective those kinds of things are occurring to me yeah yeah that's right and i've written about that in our study of um of corinthians uh going back to schofield again see i schofield wrote uh, in his commentaries and notes, and again, he's not God or anything. It's just referring that people right, knew this gotcha. before mid-Acts people talked about it. Um, he said in First Corinthians 1 about those different sects there. I'm a Paul, I'm a Christ, I'm a Paul. He said the most dangerous sect, I'll just quote what he said. It's evident the really dangerous sect in Corinth was that which said, and I of Christ. That's what mm -hmm. he said about that, which is opposite of what modern Christians say. They're going, well, that's the one we should be of Christ, not these men. 
Well, that's interesting. But Sch Schofield said that was the most dangerous sect. He says, because they rejected the new revelation through Paul of the doctrines of grace, grounding themselves probably on the kingdom teachings of our Lord as a minister of the circumcision. Oh. Uh, he sounds mid -axed. He's not mid but it's, he sounds like that because he recognizes that there was progressive revelation and Paul had mm. the latest revelation. He says, um, seemingly oblivious that a new dispensation had been introduced by Christ's death. This made necessary a defense of the origin and extent of Paul's apostolic authority. So that was Schofield. Mm -hmm. And so he says of those sects, Paul, he, Paul doesn't point out you shouldn't follow Christ or like that. He says later that you follow me, but he said yeah, probably yeah. the dangerous one is Christ because of those men listed, Apollos, Peter, Paul, all of them ministered after Christ ministered on earth. And right, so right. when Christ came and ministered, if someone said to the people at the time, the apostle said, well, I'm following Jesus, like when he was on earth and what he said, well, that's all fine and good, Be except yeah. the Holy Ghost came down at Pentecost. So you should actually follow the updated information Peter said. Yeah, it's kind of well like people them. today saying, well, I just like to follow the teachings of Jesus. I just get more yeah. a reassurance when I see those red letters, you know, I'm like, right. well, are you telling me you only go to the Jews and don't go to the Gentiles or Samaritans anymore? Because right. that's what Jesus said. Right. <laughs> you better well, or watch people, out if you're following the teachings of Jesus. Right. If that's if that's all you're doing. Or people who say, I only study the red letters, like the actual red letters in your Bible. Yeah. Get out of here. It's like someone just made those color red. The whole Bible is all inspired by God. Right. And and so <laughs> so you gotta take the whole scripture. But that's that's the frustration Schofield thinks was going on. And I, I somewhat agree with him. I think Paul is saying there's these divisions and that's not good. But then he immediately says in the same book three times, he says, Follow me. He follow says me because I'm a follower of Christ. Yeah. yeah. So if he his point is don't follow me, why is he saying follow me frequently? Well, that's it's not because he's he's egotistical. It's because he's saying over and over again, Christ gave me the, the newest information. Right, right. So if yeah. you're trying to follow Christ, you should listen to what I'm telling. Second Timothy 2 7, he says that consider what I say, and the Lord give the, Lord understanding, give the understanding in all things. In all yeah. things. And Christ was raised from the dead according to my gospel. And so it, I mean, it's it's clear when you look at Paul's epistles how many times he talks about this information Christ gave him, ignoring that idea that Christ gave it to Paul and exclusively to Paul, and we find our pattern there in the doctrines to give it to Paul, um, just sets us up for danger. Because yeah, people use First Corinthians one verse twelve and say, well, let's go back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, if you do that to the exclusion of all the apostolic epistles, you know, the writings, then there's a pr big problem. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But they're denominations doing them. I mean, they're the whole denominations. They only preach red letter doctrine. And, and, and that's, the right. that, that's why the charismatics win the battle. If you're Acts 2 dispensational or, or, or thinking it be in Matthew 16 or think the whole New Testament is the church, the Pentecostals, the, the fastest growing group of non-Catholic Christians over the last century, that, that's their strongest argument. They don't have a lot of strong arguments, but that's their strongest argument is yeah. that, look, you're following Matthew, Luke, and John. We're following what Christ sent from heaven after that in Acts 2. Mm -hmm. And I mean, how do you defend that? I mean, e even the non-charismatic Baptists and conservatives, I mean, that's a really hard thing to defend against because they think the church began at Pentecost. <laughs> and Pentecostals yeah. are saying, why don't you do what they do at Pentecost? You know, I don't know. A lot the, of the things happened since Pentecost. Right. Well, right. And so there's explanations of, of course, uh, for that. But uh, the strongest explanation for it is, well, that's not the church. And right. you can't find the gospel that saves you there in Acts 2. And okay. you can't find yeah. who you are in Acts 2. And Christ gave those gifts according to prophecy. Pentecost is a day of prophecy. And, uh, you know, that, that's all that's happening. So th that, that should drive them, as they do, to Paul. And mm -hmm. so the only place you find in Paul is in Corinthians, uh, the most carnal church in Paul's ministry. Right, um, right. Who's operating in tongues and things like that. And, and even in those chapters, Paul says what's more important than tongues is prophecy. What's more important than that is understanding who you are, uh, the perfect man. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so... I really appreciate all that. I've got about uh, maybe 10 and a half minutes left before I got to head out. You want to say a couple things about baptism? So understand that mid acts people <laughs> don't the bomb the yeah. yeah, we got we uh, mid acts folks don't baptize in water. Now it's interesting because I have come to de-emphasize water baptism myself, but I don't know if I arrived there for the same reasons. I, I don't think I did, but um, what were your reasons? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a long word study. It's like a two hour video I have on the channel oh, where wow. I had a guy come on and talk through these things. And it kind of, it kind of brewed over time, you know, I mean, cause I came, I used to be a pastor. I used I baptized uh, people in water all the time, 
um right now i i wouldn't think that was uh something that i need to do but if somebody wanted to i wouldn't turn it down you know whatever um and it's got to do this is a variety of other things i really don't want to get into those right now which i'd be happy to but i want to hear like so paul he's he's it looks like lydia's baptized it looks like he baptizes the philippian jailer mm -hmm. so if we're if we're not baptizing gentiles what's going on there like what's what's going on with baptism water baptism that is and I understand there's like seven baptisms and there's the, the one baptism and then there's so um as as you see fit with our remaining time what's going on with baptism now water baptism or any other yeah. kind so i'm going back to my broken record just because if you wanted to understand how midax perspective is and so i keep yeah. need to come back to this cuz it's not yeah, yeah. simply that we haven't answered all your questions because people can do that. You know, right, wrong positions exactly. can answer all your, your that's, objections. That's correct. That's true. Right. So I want to go back to the basics of the next. What, where do we get the power to answer these? Where's the perspective? And that's a dispensation given to Paul exclusively yep. that was kept secret since the world began that concerned the gospel, the glory of the cross, the gospel grace of God and the body of Christ, the new creature. And when you know that basic thing, then you're saying, okay, what about water baptism? Well, What's the preaching of the gospel of the cross? It does not include water baptism. The, the preaching of the cross is not get water baptized. The preaching right. of the cross is that Christ died for your sins and rose from the dead. It, the preaching of grace, the gospel of grace, is not what you do. It's what Christ did. And so that should be abundantly clear. I know there's lots of people who exercise water baptism who believe that. Now, God knows why they do, you know, and maybe you can testify some of that as well. Um, I've never water baptized anybody that's I'm, I'm a young preacher, but, um, in my church is max, but mm -hmm. the idea of the gospel being clearly not what you do would seem to exclude water baptism as a work from salvation. And mm -hmm. there's lots of Christians who say that, well, we, we water baptize, but it's not for salvation. Well, right. good. That's a good start because there are Christians who make it for salvation and right. they do it using the same passages you do saying it's not for salvation. Mm -hmm. So it's just a debate now, like you said, word studies and debating the same verses because it, Mark 16, 16 seems pretty clear that you believe it was baptized, you're saved. Um, and John baptized everybody that came to him that, right, you know, right. that, he, that believed his message. So you can make a case that water baptism was necessary. Then you get the whole dilemma of what was necessary, then what actually saves you? You know, can you be saved without it? Well, there's the guy on the cross. Everyone goes to the guy on the cross, you know, mm -hmm. the thief on the cross. But um, the, the clear gospel being God's finished work, Christ's finished work, and his death for you means you can be saved. And it has nothing to do with water baptism or, or a litany of other works that the church would say you need to do. So if there is a necessity to do it, it falls clearly in the realm of not salvation, but some sort of service to God, right? Mm -hmm. Which I think is that that necessity is contrary to where we find passages about water baptism in the Bible, uh, where every time John the Baptist preaches it, every time Jesus preaches it in Matthew, Luke, and John, it's baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And right. so... I got, an, I got a gospel rub there, you know, so I can, I can <laughs> see why when the cross wasn't revealed, the glory of the cross and Christ's finished work wasn't revealed yet, why that was a thing. I mean, washings, baptisms have been going on in Israel for, you know, since the law, uh, various washings, conversion washings, right, washings right. for ritual cleanliness, washings mm -hmm. to become a priest, which mm -hmm. remember the whole nation would become priests. And so they'd had right. to go through some washing as a nation. So all yeah. these baptisms were associated with Israel. Again, it wasn't a new thing in Matthew 3 when John the Baptist came on. It, it was an old thing. They right. asked him, why are you doing this? Not what in the world are you doing? And so it, people say, well, it replaces circumcision. Well, that's odd because they were baptizing while they were circumcising in the Old Testament. Yeah, so, I don't. I had a guy on here recently that yeah. uh, and I didn't object to him because I wanted to hear his perspective. But like, I don't buy into that whole baptism replacing circumcision stuff. That's complete yeah. nonsense. Yeah, so so the men exposition. Now, some people gospel, may have used it that way, but I don't think that's what the Bible has in mind at all. Right. So so the men exposition goes back to that that clear gospel revelation, which is the grace of God through Jesus Christ finished work. That's that's the clear gospel. And, and that means it doesn't include that, so you don't have to do that. We say, what about service and what about the body of Christ and why is Paul doing it? That's the common question. Why did Paul do it in the book of Acts? Um, you don't find Paul anywhere in his epistles instructing to be water baptized which is important because you do right. find John the Baptist doing it, Jesus doing it in Ma as a historical fact. Matthew mm -hmm. and John is part of their message. The message of Peter was repent and be baptized. That was the message. Um, 
in the name of Jesus, forgiveness of sins and all that sort of thing. But repentance and baptism were crucial to the message mm-hmm. and appeal when they asked, what shall we do? And, right. and he answered that. Paul never says this anywhere when he preaches the gospel in his epistles. Um, it's, it, it never attaches baptism to it. Uh, you can only go to Romans 6 and Colossians 2 to find him talk about baptism. And both of those places don't include water. And I know that's a debate exactly. among people. No, I'm but with you on that. Not, you know, yeah. people confuse water and baptism. They see one, they see the other. But Roman, I'm with you that Colossians 2 and Romans 6 are not about water baptism. Right. Yeah, and of course, in 1 Corinthians 1 as well, Paul says, Christ sent me not to baptize, uh, which is not is different than saying uh, Christ did not send me to baptize. Right. It's saying Christ sent me not to baptize, which is a positive command not to do something. But um, he, he thanks God in 1 Corinthians 1 that he didn't baptize any more of them. If baptism was an obedience to God's command, and, and this gets into your further agenda point about the Great Commission, then why would Paul be thankful he didn't baptize more of them? And the general explanation of this is that, well, he had other people in his ministry, and so you got the preacher and you got baptizers and all that. I just don't buy that, that when Paul says they're debating over this, and then later in the epistle, he brings it up again, and he says the real issue is the resurrection of Christ, mm-hmm. right? It's, it's not about how you baptized or something. He said, I thank God it baptize you because it, it would take away the preaching of the cross. He says, um, he sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, which means the gospel is not baptism, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Mm-hmm. So you see how Paul talks about the cross there. He's talking about it as if this cross has power that we mm-hmm. need. Yeah. And if, if there's baptism that's going to interfere with that, then I'm glad I didn't do it any more than I did. Right, right, yeah. Um, and he goes on to expound on the power of the cross and the preaching of the cross for Christians one. So th- this is this is a Pauline perspective, a mid-exposition on it, mid-ex-Pauline dispensationalism, is that we are powers from the cross, not from the water. And, right, uh, right. Then why would you do it? And again, historically, there have been people who'd recognize Paul's apostleship who continued in the tradition of baptism. There's a, a church down in Indianapolis that was reported to me that they still water baptized. And, and uh, a parishioner asked them, well, why do you do that if you think that the gospel is given to Paul? And they say, well, it's because people want to, and that's a tradition. And it, it goes back to that ministerial problem I see that mm-hmm. um, it, it's causing confusion. Um, I don't see why people would need to do it. And if someone comes to me and says, well, can I be water baptized? I'm going to have a long conversation with them. There was a, a young girl who, um, a, a, a teenager uh, who came up to me years ago and said she wanted to be water baptized after hearing right. us preach the cross. Now, we did not talk about baptism at all. It was just the cross. Christ, we're trying to get the people saved. Right, Christ right. died for your sins. It's what he did. And she comes up to me and says, well, can I be baptized? We said, where did you hear this? It wasn't from us. Like, why? And she said from another church who said if they, she wanted to be a part of the church, she'd be water baptized. And she wanted to be a part of what we were doing. Yeah. But she wanted to do that. Well, we had to have a long conversation. It's like, well, no, look, this is not the deal. I mean, if you believe the gospel, you're in the body of Christ, you're in the church, the body of Christ. Yeah, and yeah. we want to make sure you understand that and that you're saved. And so the fact that people would, would do it in the church either shows their own ignorance about the gospel or their own ignorance about who the church is, like how you get mm-hmm. in the church, um, or it's causing confusion. Mm-hmm. And so again, this, this is something that kind of falls away. So it's not something that mid acts is, is we're, we're not attacking it as an enemy. It's obviously biblical. Right. And Paul did it. It's just, it's going to cause confusion, which I think and this is reading between lines not in the Bible, that that's why Christ told Paul to stop, is that um, it's going to confuse the ministry. Um, so, your so does that then, mean, so Paul's baptizing, I guess, as what you might call procedural inertia, and then uh, God tells him stop. So, something like that. Yeah, it's Acts 18 is the last time you find record of him baptizing, which he mentions in 1 Corinthians 1, and it's in Corinth, where he baptizes some people in Corinth. Acts 18 says that. And then he writes an epistle to that church later and says, I'm glad I didn't baptize anymore. And and it's in that same context in Acts Mm -hmm. 18 that it says Christ appeared to him and spoke to him. So we don't know everything that he said to it. So some speculation there. But um, I think the stronger case is not like, well, Christ said something there for him to stop. Yeah, first Corinthians 1, but we don't have anything in Acts that tells us that directly. But what we do have is the message in Paul's epistles very clearly stating the gospel has nothing to do with your works. And who you are has nothing to do. Being a part of the church has nothing to do with any sort of ritual or activity that's done. Uh, Paul was water baptized by Ananias. But of course, Mm -hmm. Ananias was not given the mystery. And uh, Paul wasn't there teaching himself. And so that's definitely something that just happened because that's what Ananias as a person would do. Yeah, I'm having to point out to people that uh, Acts 22.16 took place chronologically back in Acts chapter 9. That's right. That's right. Acts 22. Yeah. Thank you for pointing that out. You're right. That is a major, 
back and forth. Yes, Acts 22 and Acts 26 are actually taking place in Acts 9. So that's Paul's right. testimony in right. court over what happened in Acts 9. So, so yeah, he's telling what happened then. Um, yeah, Acts 18 is the last chronological event record that we find of it. Um, we don't find it at all in Paul's epistles. Uh, the baptism you have in Romans 6 is in Christ's death, which is a much better baptism than Ephesians, than, um, than water baptism. And um, yeah, so, so that's a mid acts perspective on it. Why did Paul baptize? Uh, we have quite a few resources on that on the website to speculate on it. I think like the other questions you've been asking, this is somewhat of an internal yeah, yeah. mid acts dispute. It doesn't undermine the mid acts position at all. Right, right. Um, it's just a question. Uh, but it's also a question everyone else has. They say, well, we have a question for you about this. Well, everyone else debates baptism as well. It's just simply yeah. we have a stronger case of why we shouldn't do it. Yeah, because yeah. We're, we know we're saved by the cross. And we know who we are by the body of Christ. So, again, I've asked people, why do you want to? Someone says, well, we should do it as the church. Why? And you wait. Tradition's not a good answer. You know, um, so we've always done it this way. Not a good answer. What's the scriptural reason for why? You know, it's a testimony of what? The cross <laughs> is made of wood and blood. Water isn't a good testimony. Well, they preach it like you're dying in the water. Yeah, I get it. You can symbolize anything with that. But we don't find scriptural evidence for doing that. You know, so. And uh, I'd much rather preach the gospel plain, plainly, than to hide it behind symbolism. And uh, right, so right, if that's right. people's reason, then, again, another reason why we wouldn't. I've never been water baptized. And I, I, I say that not to boast one or another, but simply just to provoke maybe some people that really hold to it, to <laughs> question why they think it needs to be done. Um, you'd have to doubt my salvation or service or obedience or something. And I, right, I hope right. that that is something that would not be proven. But I've never, it just never happened. Um, people have tried to get me to do it. I, I always wanted to find out why, and I never settled with it. And then I learned to rightly divide. And then I was like, well, this definitely is not where I need to go. Um, so I just never been. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, that makes uh, very coherently put forth. So I really appreciate that. Um, sure. I happen to be up against a hard time break. Um, Cause I, uh, like I told you before we came on, I'm working from home. I have to end to take <laughs> a work call here. Yeah. <laughs> so uh work call Thanks for letting me ramble on no i really i really appreciate that so i want to reiterate before we go like um you mentioned that perhaps you know we got through item three out of eight if That's uh if you're okay with coming back for more i'd love to have you come back if, if uh you're willing to set that back up okay um and if you don't get castigated for letting me on then sure it's I, you know i get castigated for many things all the time um <laughs> Uh, if you keep watching my channel, you'll probably think I'm a heretic too, <laughs> but I do want to reiterate for people. Um, if you want to, there, there are so many resources on the grace ambassadors website that I, I cannot overstate it. Lots and lots of stuff to see there. So I'll encourage people from the audience to go check out the website, check out uh, the YouTube channel and watch until your heart's content a lot of things are explained there that we don't have a lot of time for here and that i haven't even had time to uh, explore myself um but before we go any any uh last words before we part that's it kevin uh i just want to emphasize one more time as my broken record is that you know the bid exposition really begins with that clear gospel it begins yep. with who we are in christ it, it it doesn't start with the rapture it doesn't start with explaining the book of acts or where we're at in revelation it's making the gospel clear and I think that's necessary um, for the church ministry to function properly. And I think mid-acts is the, the clearest explanation of the biblical narrative to do that. Well, again, yeah, I really appreciate you coming on and, and explaining Thank this. Thank you, Kevin, for letting me come on. Clear. Absolutely. So I uh, look forward to, to doing this again, hopefully soon. Sure. All right. Thanks, Justin. You have a good one. All right.